everybody for joining us today. My name is Adam Wagner. I'm a principal serverless solutions architect at AWS. I'm joined my, by Uma. My name is Uma Ramadas. I am also a solutions architect at AWS, and I focused on serverless. So today, we are going to talk about some of the pain points of processing data, and especially large scale data, and how those pain points can be alleviated by serverless. And so we'll go through some of the benefits of serverless data processing, and we'll also show you how to accelerate that data processing when you're using services such as AWS Step Functions and AWS Lambda. We'll show you a demo and leave you with some best practices and key takeaways. The goal of the session is to leave you with an understanding that how you can process data with AWS Step Functions and AWS Lambda, and how to get quickly started when you build it yourself. When you are presented with large-scale data processing problem, you come up with some design technology choices based on some traits of data, like for example, type of data, volume of data. I have given here some common traits that you would use to come up with that design uh, choices. The first of all is scale. In many aspects of our life, you know, whether from business, business operations to personal interactions, we use digital platforms. And these digital platforms or digital transformations has led to generation of vast amount of data. So understanding the scale and growth of the data will help you choose the right technology that you are going to use. Timeliness. Most data processing jobs are scheduled jobs. So when you have a scheduling, jo scheduling jobs, it introduces delay in understanding the meaning of the data. So if you want to understand the meaning of the data quickly, go to market faster. You want to look at technologies that offer you real-time or even-driven data processing solutions or even micro-batch processing solutions. Variability. Fluctuations in data volume is common due to seasonality of the trend or, uh, or like say, uh, sales events like uh, Black Friday. Variability means you also have to have scalable infrastructure and resources. Being able to scale up and scale down when you know, data uh, spikes happens. Integration. Data processing is not a single task most often. It consists of uh, multiple distinct steps, from cleansing to formatting, transforming, um, you know, aggregating, reporting, etc. And sometimes these distinct tasks happen in purpose-built services. You need a way to coordinate all of these different tasks to achieve your business process and manage all the interactions. Let me explain it with an example. Invoice processing is a common use case for many business organizations. If you are part of a supply chain company, that might be the bread and butter of what you do. Invoices come in variety of formats, variety of types. You know, some are scanned images, some are electronic, manual. So in, in you process these invoices, you know, you need to extract that data. It contains information about suppliers, vendors, purchase orders, even like thousands of purchase orders within a single invoice. And you need to verify the sales order quantity, send it to payments, and sometimes involve human in the loop if, you know, if a payment amount goes beyond a certain amount, which means you've got lots and lots of interactions within this invoice processing. Let's assume you have got this invoice processing for like 500,000 invoices daily. And there's, there's going to be some fluctuations in the you know, data based on seasonality of the trend. So as any application developer do, what I would do is like I might look into processing it using a for loop. And I know that it's not going to work for half a million records. And so I do need for loops, but I do have to process them in parallel. You know, so I would, I would go with like multi-threading. So I will run multiple threads in parallel so I can process records in parallel. But then when I deploy it, I will vertically scale that machine, add more horsepower, add more CPU, add more memory, thinking that I can increase the thread count that will in turn improve the performance. Sometimes I will also look into re-platforming, going to a more performant or up-to-date hardware. Now what happens is, I will soon realize the performance is not going to improve. Think about when we add more CPU, the thread count is actually relational to 
the um, CPU, which means, you know, I think adding more CPU will increase the thread count, which in turn increase the performance. But at some point, the performance gap is going to be very, very flat. So for half a million records, I might even look at like days to achieve it. But as, as an application developer, now I am, instead of focusing on business logic, I am, right, I am looking into right-sizing threads, right-sizing servers. Now what happens is I end up might, I might end up over provisioning or under provisioning the servers. So there is a better approach, and in fact, the right approach to do this, you know, large scale data processing, which is distributed computing. The underlying business logic that you're writing is not going to change. You're going to write the same business logic. Instead of running in multiple threads, you're going to run it at multiple processes. And these processes are going to run in a completely different, distinct compute nodes. And you will have some, something like a coordinator component to divide up this large data set and distribute it to these multiple machines and get the work done and, co and do all those interactions like client communications, et cetera. So the overarching goal is actually break down this large data set, which requires significantly larger mem you know, CPU and memory are sometimes infeasible to be done in a one single beefy instance to a smaller manageable data sets that can be allocated to multiple compute nodes. Those compute nodes that we see in green um, in the diagram. Now this technique, this technique provides multiple benefits. One of them is of course, faster time to market. You are able to process like 500 million records, 500,000 records within maybe um, hours instead of waiting for days to do it. And it is also scalable. If there is a sales event and you got like 2 million records today to process, you really don't have to re-architect your entire solution. You just add additional node and get things done. We're also avoiding single point of failure. And we're not processing everything in one single big machine. We are distributing the data set across multiple compute nodes so we have partial failures. We're not having complete failure. And the coordinator component can be designed to handle these partial failures. And last but not the least, the solution is, not, is also cost effective because we are processing much faster. And that is the main reason it is, it is um, cost effective and we are also shutting down the compute nodes when they, everything is done instead of maintaining one beefy instance. So this is also cost effective. So though this one, uh, this technique is really attractive, it also introduces some challenges. One of them is managing concurrency. Now as an application developer, you are responsible for setting up, provisioning, and managing all of those clusters because these you know, uh, compute instances typically run in a serverful environment. Now as an application developer, you might also have to learn a completely new technology like distributed um, processing frameworks. And that is a big learning curve. And sometimes in some organizations, there can be specialized teams like infrastructure team, networking team, so you may have to go coordinate back and forth between the teams to achieve the, the, you know, business, the processing applications um, to complete in, in time. So balancing or striking that balance between cost, security, and speed is also challenging. Now, how do we have the faster development velocity and operational efficiency without going through all of this uh, serverful, responsive, you know, what we call it as like heavy lifting, right? Operational burden. How do we do that? I'm going to talk about how serverless can benefit, especially application developers, without going through all of this operational burden. We all know there is no service to manage with serverless. Serverless also integrate very well with the rest of the AWS services and outside AWS services easily and natively. And so it increases your development velocity. Next, whether you are processing 100,000 records or 1 million records, 
you really don't have to deal with you know, in increasing the server capacity or anything. It naturally scales to the demand and just shuts down when you're not using it. So you handle that variability with ease. And you can also go to, from a take your idea to implementation within days, sometimes within weeks. And with pay-as-you-go model. So you're also lowering the cost with serverless. The heart of serverless is AWS Lambda. In AWS Lambda, you write your code in your favorite programming language, and you deploy it. You really don't have to worry about servers. And when you can run your Lambda function, or the function that you write in your Lambda, in response to changes in state or response to changes in resource state, for example, you can upload a file to S3. You can have Lambda function trigger in response to that event. You can have your Lambda function run in response to an API that gets invoked from your user interface. Lambda function can call other AWS services and also services and APIs that you have in on-prem. For data processing workloads, you require or you will do compute intensive, memory intensive work. So Lambda functions support up to 10 gigabytes of memory. And some data processing work also requires some local storage. For example, you, you are doing video processing, you might store some data locally. And if you are extracting data from a large invoice uh, file, which is a PDF file, you might need some local storage. So Lambda function also offers 10 gigabytes of local or temporary storage. As I said earlier, you just write your code and deploy it. What you need to do is package it as a zip archive, your code as well as your dependencies. If you have large libraries or you have some reusable code and you want to share with other Lambda functions, you can package them as layers. And the, there are um, some public layers available. And I was talking about layers, I realized there are lots of public layers available, especially for data processing. And if you want to use um, Pandas, you can use AWS SDK for Pandas. Um, if you're video processing, you can use FFmpeg. Um, if you're using NumPy, you can use, you can use Sci-Fi. So these public layers are already available, so you don't really have to create your custom private layers and manage it yourself. If you're somebody who is from a containers um, background and you are familiar with containers tooling, you can also deploy Lambda function as a container image. You write your Docker image and you package them and deploy it in Lambda and you'll be able to run your code. Container packaging is also advantageous because data processing workloads sometimes require custom libraries that can go beyond the 250 megabytes of .zip um, format. They support up to 10 gigabytes of packaging. Now, in our earlier diagram that we saw, now I've replaced those green compute nodes with Lambda function. Right? I hope that makes sense now. Now, let's move on to that coordinator component. So the invoice processing use case that I talked about earlier, if you remember, there is uh, lots of integrations. There is a process that you need to do, extract that data and verify the quantities and also send for payment. As any good developer do, you would write them as microservices. And if you write them as microservices, how would you manage that interaction, coordinate all those microservices to achieve your invoice processing business use case uh, as a business process? How do you visualize what's going on? How do you troubleshoot or inspect errors if there is something wrong with it? And that's where I think the step functions as a coordinator comes into play. It is a low-code, serverless, visual workflow service. As you can see in that um, video, you can just drag and drop any AWS services up to 10,000 plus AWS APIs into that designer studio and then create your workflow. It could be a Lambda function, it can be an ECS task, it can be an EMR job or a glue job. You can just drag and drop them and create your workflows. You can add payload, 
you can configure retries, you can also handle errors through that um, designer tool also. You can create design, uh, you can create decision trees, you can run tasks in parallel, you can iterate on arrays. Adam later will talk about like iterating arrays. It's, it's not just iterating arrays in a traditional sense, you iterate arrays and each iteration can run in parallel as well. There are also other reasons to use step functions. Someone somewhere said source code is a liability, not an asset. Maintaining and managing source code is a lot of work. It's time consuming. You need an ongoing effort. What I mean by that is it, you're, you're responsible for your source code and you have your source code as, your has, uh, as well as your dependencies. So you need to manage your source code as secure, not vulnerable. And so you do uh, security scanning you need to make sure the dependencies that you have are like right dependencies. If you're upgrading it, you also have to ma make sure the back it, it, they are backward compatible. So all of those you need to do in your source code. Step functions is a low code service. So if you can reduce all those code that you need to write to fewer lines, and you can write it in JSON or YAML, like. Step functions definition is expressed in ASL, Amazon states language. Step function also offers additional cap visual capabilities to observe everything going on. And so that is another reason for application developers to use step functions. Now let me show you with an example. I've taken here a very classic example of how uh, retrieving some data from a database. Our data is stored in Amazon DynamoDB. And so in order to connect to the DynamoDB, I need to use an API. It you know, um, really integrates very well with the Lambda function. You just have to call an API. So I use the uh, DynamoDB API client, and then I need to configure some table information where my data is, and also some keys like by, uh, by which I'm querying the data. And then actually I'm calling DynamoDB and I'm wrapping up with some retries and error handling. In fact, like my retries is not a graceful retries either. In fact, like I'm just actually <laughs> catching the errors. Um, in your real life code, you may have graceful retries. In your, in your real life code, you may also have logging, some kind of structured logging, in, uh, include logging framework. So there's 20 lines of code, and bug can occur in any of these 20 lines of code. If I want to convert this to a workflow, I'll just add one step to it, DynamoDB get item. I don't have to worry about the library that I need to use. I don't have to worry about version upgrades. I just add DynamoDB get item, and configure the table name and the keys. And then I can configure retries. And if things fail, I can send it to a DLQ, a dead letter queue, which is, you know, in here I use Amazon SQS. Visually, you know, I can see everything in the, in the console itself. Now anybody can look at this and see, know what's going on. You know, whereas on the other side, only Node.js developer would be able to understand what is going on. During development, we're all going to have like so many, you know, back and forth with writing code. And Step Functions offers you a complete visibility into what is happening. You can look into errors. You can look into what is the input that went to the state, what is the output, what error you got, without writing single line of logging code. So now our earlier diagram, I've replaced it with AWS Step Functions as a coordinator and Lambda as a compute. Let's look at how you can schedule this workflow. You can schedule it and you can also run it event-driven. And you know, running it event-driven, like I said, it's easy, um, it is easy to get the meaning out of data immediately, whereas a scheduled workflows um, introduces some delays. Step functions integrates really well with like 10,000 plus AWS APIs, and we saw that earlier in that video. Step functions can also be triggered in multiple different ways. One of the common ways is using Amazon EventBridge. 
EventBridge is a serverless event router. It, it decouples the producer and consumer. EventBridge has a component called a scheduler. You can use that scheduler to schedule your workflows. You can also call step functions workflow with, uh, from step functions. It's a kind of a nice way to write reusable work workflows. You can mix and match uh, different flavors of workflows. Adam will talk about it later. You can also have the workflow run in response to APIs from your user interface. And there are many other ways to invoke workflows. So if you're doing a batch data processing, you would be writing your schedule in your Amazon EventBridge scheduler and run your step functions. And then step functions, in our case where we had the invoice processing use case, our invoices will exist in Amazon S3, which is a cloud storage where you can store and retrieve any amount of data from anywhere. So our invoices are in Amazon S3, step functions list all these objects and then orchestrate those multiple data sets we have with Lambda functions. This can be Lambda function, this can be ECS task, or this can be any of the uh, 10,000 plus AWS APIs. You can also trigger the workflows near real time, or real time. For example, if you wanna kick your workflow when a file lands in S3, um, you can set up an S3 event notification, and that can target Amazon EventBridge. S3 event notification has many targets. One of them is Amazon EventBridge. And EventBridge can target a function's workflow directly. So now your workflow can be kicked off immediately when a file is uploaded. You can also kick off your workflow in response to events in your on-premise systems. For example, if you have Kafka, and you have events coming in from Kafka, or you have um, Amazon MQ or SQS, you wanna trigger your workflow in response to events coming from there, you can connect Amazon EventBridge pipes with them. So EventBridge pipe is a peer-to-peer -peer integration service that connects the uh, source, event sources to event target. In our case, event target is a workflow. All right, so far we talked about how the data processing at large scale is challenging and how serverless can help. Um, Adam is going to talk about how you can actually do the data processing. I'm gonna step aside, thank you. All right, cool. So uh, if you know, we take a look at that diagram again and we see we now have the data being processed by Lambda, the coordination happening by step functions and then we're gonna store the results out in S3 so that they're, they're durably stored. So let's get into the details of how we do this with step functions. So one of the many task states that you have in uh, step functions is a, a functionality called map. And the map functionality had been around for a little while. It allowed you to do kind of arbitrary parallelism, right? So send in a list of objects that you want to operate over. And that could be 100 items, it could be 10 items, it could be variable. And this was loved by customers, used in a lot of cool ways, but it had some limitations. It could only scale out to process 40 things in parallel. So I could send in that list of 100, but there would only be 40 of them operating at the same time. And so last year, we came out with a, a version of that map state that we called distributed map. And with distributed map, we scale way out. We can scan out, uh, scale out to process 10,000 things in parallel. And it allows you to process lots of data. It also integrates with S3. So if you have hundreds of thousands of objects in S3, we can iterate over those objects. You might also have one really large object in S3. Maybe you have a monster CSV file with a million rows in it. We can point at that file and iterate on those individual rows of that CSV file. So really, really powerful way to do distributed data processing without having to manage servers, uh, learn new frameworks, things like that. And so if we go back to that invoice processing use case that Uma started with early on, if you think about the logic that you have to write 
you can now just think about a single invoice. What do I need to do with a single invoice? Well, it might come in as a PDF. I'm gonna convert that PDF to text. Once I have that text, I'm gonna do that actual processing. And you don't have to think about the scalability of this because step functions and distributed map is gonna take care of scaling that out. You just focus on your business logic, keep it simple. And then at the end, when we're done processing all of them, we go off and we, we trigger some reporting. So just another view of this, another look at what distributed map looks like and, and how it works. On the left-hand side here, we have S3 as our input source. And so we're gonna point at S3, and let's say we have the 500,000 invoices. We're gonna say, hey, step functions distributed map, look here in S3. Step functions distributed map is going to look at all that make a big list of all of those objects in S3, all of those files that we need to process. And then it's gonna execute a child workflow. So distributed map actually has this child workflow concept where that data processing, whatever steps you wanna do, are within this child workflow. And there's some advantages to that that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. And we've talked about that data processing as being done by Lambda, but you can do anything you can do within a step functions within that child workflow, within distributed map. So you could be calling AWS SDKs, be calling uh, ECS, uh, AWS batch, anything you want within there. And then optionally, we can write out the summarized results out to S3. Because if we're processing 500,000 objects, like it's, we gotta put all of that resulting data somewhere. It allows you to easily write that out to S3. And so I'll now transition away from the slides and let's just go over to the Step Functions console and I'll show you what this looks like in another example. So here we are in the step functions console, but before I get into the details of this step function, I wanna talk about the, the use case that we're gonna use. So we're gonna move a little ways away from invoice processing. And we're actually grab some data from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, uh, which is a, a US organization that gathers all sorts of climate and weather data. They have this really interesting um, data set that is weather data that goes all the way back to 1929. And it's from all over the world. So weather stations from all over the world report this data and they have this data summed up in CSV files. And if I look at one of these individual CSV files, each one is data from a single uh, weather station. So this one is from, I'm gonna butcher the name, I'm sure, um, Hakadal in Norway. If there's anyone from Norway, you can tell me after how that's actually pronounced. Um, but so this is all this data from Norway, uh, and it's basically uh, you know, one piece of data per day for the year of 1960. And so there's a lot of these files. There's 500,000, a little more, of these files. And in total, it's over 40 gigabytes of data. So it's a lot of data, but it's not huge, huge, huge amounts of data. But it's a lot of small files. And if you look at a lot of data processing, ways to process data like this, a lot of them struggle with this small file use case. All right, so let's go and take a look at the step function that we're gonna use to, to process this data. And I, I didn't mention yet what we're gonna do, right? How we're gonna process this data. So the idea is, let's look through all this data, worldwide weather data going back to 1929, and for every month from 1929 until now, let's find the place on the planet with the highest temperature. And we'll record what that temperature is and where it was recorded. And we'll write that out into a DynamoDB table. So let's go take a look at the, the state machine itself. So this is that visual workflow builder that you saw earlier. So you can drag and drop you know, different states in here to uh, you know, create your state machines. So in this case, it's a fairly straightforward state machine. We have our distributed map here where we're gonna process through all those 500,000 files 
And then we have this lambda function at the end that we call a reducer. So if you think about each individual lambda function that's going to process a subset of those 500,000 files, it's going to find lots of local maximums, right? So it's looking at you know, 50 weather stations and saying, oh, out of these weather stations, for each month, this was the high temperature. But we're going to get lots of those, and we need to correlate them at the end and say, OK, this was actually the highest temperature of the, the, whole, um, the whole world, and then write them to DynamoDB. And so that's what that reducer function is going to do. So let's take a look at the distributed map configuration and what's in there. Make this a little bigger. All right, so over here in the distributed map, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that we're using the distributed version of map. So that original map that I talked about has that limitation of, of uh, 40. It's still there, uh, but we're using distributed map in this case. I choose the input source. So again, we're going to use S3 as our input source. This is really great because you don't have to think about kind of loading the data in. The data is in S3, and we're just going to point step functions distributed map at that uh, bucket. So I'm pointing it at the bucket. In this case, I'm not even pointing it at a specific, you know, subfolder within the bucket. I'm just pointing it at the whole bucket. And then a very important feature is the ability to batch. So I could send one of these CSV files to that Lambda function and just run that Lambda function 500,000 times. But I showed you those files, right? Each file is pretty small. And so I can actually get some efficiency by sending a batch of messages to that Lambda function. This is a great way to tune performance and to tune cost of your uh, step function that you're using for data processing. So definitely a good, uh, a good value to play around with and you know, figure out where's that sweet spot from a performance and a cost perspective. You can also limit it by the kind of size of the overall batch versus the number of items as well. Another knob that I have is the concurrency that that distributed map is going to use. And so in this case, I have it set to 1,000. 10,000 concurrency is really big. And not all AWS services can handle scaling from 0 to 10,000 really quickly. And so you need to think about the services that you're going to call within that distributed map and whether they can you know, uh, like meet that, that scale. The other thing that I chose is the child execution type. So remember, I said the iterations of this distributed map are actually step functions workflows themselves. And I can choose to use either a standard workflow, which is what you use for most step functions workflows, long running workflows, uh, or I can use what's called an express workflow. Express workflows are really good for short lived workflows that are going to be high volume. And so in this case, it fits perfectly for within that distributed map because each one of those lambda functions, it's not going to run for very long, it runs pretty quickly. And then lastly, I'm going to choose an export location. So I'm going to say, hey, at the end of my distributed map, write out the results of that distributed map to this location in S3. Whole bunch of, of things about that that I'll, I'll talk about uh, in a moment. One other thing I wanted to, to touch on before we run this and, and show how it works, you know, the, uh, Uma earlier talked about kind of, uh, you know, moving away from code, right, and the, the low code nature. One of the great things here is the error handling. So if I look at the details of this Lambda function, I have very uh, easy to configure error handling. On all these different error exceptions, I can decide how many times do I want to retry if I run into an error. Do I want to retry once? Do I want to retry twice? In this case, I'm actually retrying eight times. I can choose my back off rate. I can add jitter. I can choose like a max amount that I want to back off and retry for. And so this is great. This is code you don't have to write. It's code that doesn't differentiate you, right? I don't think anyone in this room, if we did a survey, my guess is 
no one would say, oh, the, the thing that is key to my business is our retry logic, right? Probably not. That's not the key thing that you need to be thinking about. So if it's not the key thing you need to be thinking about, offload it to step functions and let it do it for you. So enough talking, let's run the actual uh, distributed map. So I'm gonna execute this. This is the input to the step function. In this case, I don't need to give it any specific input, so I'm just gonna leave the default uh, input there. So when you run a step function, you get this great operator experience. You get a visual view of what's happening in your step function. So the blue here indicates that this is what's in progress currently. This is the step that's running in progress. And because that step that's running is a distributed map, I have this special map run console, which we'll go into. And in the map run console, I have a bunch of the um, configurations that we looked at earlier. Things like, what's the batch size? What's the concurrency? When did it start running? And then I have the item processing stats. And so the first thing that it's gonna do is it's listing out all those objects in S3 and getting all the things that it's gonna iterate over. And so it's doing that right now, pulling in those 500,000 plus objects, and then it's gonna start executing them. It just started executing them, and one of the things I wanna point out here is that some of them failed. Trying to make this a real kind of real world uh, example, I wanted some of them to fail. Very often, if you have these large data sets, not every piece of data is gonna process perfectly. And so a great feature that we have here is this tolerated failure threshold. And that tolerated failure threshold allows me to say, hey, I want X percent of failures to be okay without failing the whole workflow. And the great thing is, it's gonna write out all those objects that did fail, it's gonna put them in a separate failed results file for me in the end, so that it's really easy for me to rerun them or report out on what items failed, what items need to do. If I look here, I have all the individual child executions of uh, the workflow that are running, so a whole bunch of these are running right now. If I refresh it again, I should get some that have succeeded. I can click into those, I can see the input that went in, I can see the output that came out in terms of the stations, the weather stations it found that had the highest temperature values for a given month and year. So if I go back over here to the overall workflow, oops, let me get over here. The distributed map finished, and now the reducer finished as well. And so in less than two and a half minutes, we processed 500,000 plus files and 40 gig of data. If you think about traditional data processing, if you were gonna spin up a cluster to do this, you wouldn't even be done spinning up the cluster and we'd already be finished processing that data. So this really works great as a way to quickly process data. And now I'll go over to our results table here this is the DynamoDB table that has the results data in it. And so we can click into uh, month in 19, uh, so May in 1945, and we can see that the max temperature was 112.3 in def, I don't know what that is, in, in some place that uh, I'm not sure what that town is. And so, uh, I hope that gives you a good idea of step functions and specifically distributed map and what it's like to process data with distributed map. A uh, lot of real power here to be able to build these workflows and process large amounts of data. We see use cases for distributed map and processing data in these ways across a, a wide variety of uh, different industries and use cases, uh, large scale unstructured file processing, uh, data modeling for like financial institutions. We have a great case study uh, up on um, our website about that. Uh, I had a great customer that did really cool data migration using distributed map where they were moving all the data related to some users that were based in Europe from an American system to a new European system. 
All they had to do is just code how to move one user, and then they just fed it giant lists of users, quickly move them over. Uh, really, really cool use case. We have a bunch of resources. This is actually a resource page for a talk that Uma and I are gonna do at reInvent. But there's a bunch of great resources, learning materials, uh, links to serverlessland.com and a pattern repository that has that example that I showed along with many other step function examples. So a great place to go and get uh, you know, resources to start learning more about this, try things out, play with it, uh, all that sort of stuff. One of those main places that it points you is serverlessland.com, which has a, a bunch of great uh, resources on that. Uh, but with that, I'll just say thank you for taking the time. Uma and I really, really appreciate it. Uh, we have our, our details up there. If you want to reach out to us, ask questions, uh, always happy to, to answer questions. And please don't forget to uh, go and vote for this session in your go-to guide.